The Vape Passion Show, episode 37. Welcome back to the Vape Passion Show. This is episode 37. I'm recording this on Sunday, October 9th. Like usual, I've had a pretty busy weekend filled with lots of family activities. On Friday evening, we went to an art event in a nearby town. There were three exhibits around the town. The main event was filled with art inspired by Dia de los Muertos, or Day of the Dead. There was a a great guitar duo there playing Latin-infused music. They go by the name of Guitarosaurus and Cordzilla, and uh, they have a Facebook page that you can check out if you're interested. Um, Here's a recording I took of them playing. They were really good. We sat in the front row and my daughter was entranced by them. According to their Facebook page, it looks like they play music from Rodrigo y Gabriela, as well as some heavy metal songs and some of their own original work. They played a little Metallica uh, on Friday and that was pretty cool. They were a lot of fun to watch and listen to. There was also a party bus taking everyone to the other art locations around town. It, and it was cool because it was fully stocked with pop, beer, whiskey, and champagne, and all of it was free. The entire event was free, even with lots of food, so uh, that was really cool. Because, you know, uh, going out can be pretty expensive, so I'm all for free stuff. And then yesterday we went to the Pumpkin Patch and Corn Maze, also not far from my house. Uh, that was a lot of fun. The That one was all a bunch of kids' activities. Uh, we got snow cones, took lots of pictures, got some pumpkins. Uh, we, my daughter made a, a little sand art bottle and uh, got pretty nice and dehydrated because it was so damn hot. It's still hot here in Colorado. But uh, yeah, that was fun too. Oh, and then I also stopped by InnoVapor. Um, they're a, a vape shop. They have nine locations around the Denver area, and the closest one to me is in Thornton. Uh, so that's where I went. I actually did a review of their shop about a year ago of their of their shop and their house-made e-juice because I like that place so much. Their house-made e-juices are really good and their customer service is top-notch. That's actually why I did a review of them in the first place because I like their customer service so much. Uh, Well, anyway, the the owner of InnoVapor, he actually came across my video last week and told me to stop in for some free e-juice and thanks for my review, so I did. And I picked up five flavors and I have them all sitting here next to me. So, there's, let's see, what do I got here? I got banana cream, cin- cinnamon cookie custard, vanilla custard, watermelon, and grape soda. All really good sounding flavors. I haven't actually tried any of them yet. Uh, not even sampled them at the shop, so I have no idea how good they will be. But everything I tried from, from them in the past was pretty good. So I feel pretty confident that these are going to be good too. And just like the last time I was in there, the customer service was great. Those guys are just super nice. I don't know what the, the other eight shops are like, but the one in Thornton is excellent. So if you live anywhere near that area, uh, check them out for sure. All right, so let's get into it now. Um, the biggest news in the vaping community in regards to politics comes in the form of an announcement from Gary Johnson. Uh, he's a libertarian third-party candidate running for president this election. Kurt Loblick of Cloud Chasers Inc. managed to receive an email response from Gary Johnson's national campaign director, Jim Wallace, about their campaign's thoughts on the vaping industry. So the email said, quote, In the first debate, voters listened to two candidates dance around the American economy. What you'll never hear from those candidates is how the economy is being killed by excessive regulation. Vaping, a new industry offering products as a healthier alternative to smoking, is about to be regulated out of existence. That just doesn't make any sense. End quote. He also stated that, quote, As Governor G- Gary Johnson has said, the free market and entrepreneurial spirit should be encouraged, not destroyed. Nowhere is this more obvious than the vaping industry. End quote. Both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump have all but ignored the vape community's plea to talk about what's happening to the vape industry. If these lawsuits against the FDA by... Uh, companies like Nicopure, Lost Art Liquids, and the Right to Be Smoke Free Coalition fail, vaping will no longer exist in less than two years. So people are, are really interested in this, uh, this news this past week. Uh, most of the discussion I'm seeing around it is negative towards Gary Johnson, uh, with most people saying that Gary Johnson is not fit for presidency based on his beliefs. Uh, I'm not going to go into those reasons. You can look them up for yourself. 
Um, I'm personally, I'm not a single issue voter and I definitely wouldn't vote for Gary Johnson just because he supports vaping. Vaping is important to me, but so are many other things in life. And it's, for me, I have to look at the bigger picture. But what I think is really great about Gary Johnson publicly supporting vaping is that he finally brought the topic to the attention of people who might not have any idea about what's happening in the industry. Uh, I hope this works its way up to Trump and Clinton. It's not likely to be a topic that they ever talk about in a national debate, but maybe they'll say something about vaping outside of debates, like in an email, like Gary Johnson did. As for who's the best candidate for vaping between Clinton and Trump, that's hard to say. There are good arguments on both sides. Some people believe that Trump is the best candidate because he's in favor of less regulations and because he cares about the best interests of business owners. But then other people say that Trump only cares about large businesses, not small businesses, which is what most of the vape industry consists of. And not only that, but his VP pick, Mike Pence, is the governor of Indiana who has major ties with big tobacco and practically banned vaping in his home state with crazy re regulations. And as for Hillary, well, based on her history in politics and the Democrat Party in general, she's just not likely at all to help the industry. So Trump seems a little more likely to do something positive for vaping, but personally, I don't believe any candidate is going to change anything happening in the vape industry. I think it's really just going to have to come down to fighting the regulations the way we are right now with lawsuits. So hopefully these lawsuits happening right now uh, work out in our favor. So yeah, that, that response from Gary Johnson, uh, it is some good news. All right, the next topic here, Brent from regulatorwatch.com, he interviewed Stanton Glantz. Stanton Glantz is one of the biggest anti-vaping extremists. And Stanton Glantz, he came on to Regulator Watch for an interview. Uh, you can see that video on YouTube. The one thing that really bothered me about this interview was that Stanton Glantz kept repeating that e-cigs are a gateway to smoking cigarettes for kids. And not just some kids, but he says a substantial amount of kids. The thing is, though, that there's no data supporting this claim, although there have been studies that debunk it. It's disgusting the lies that come out of this guy's mouth. If you're wondering where Glantz gets his idea from in regards to kids vaping, it's from a study that was performed not too long ago that asked kids if they have used e-cigs. But there was a major flaw with this study. Uh, the researchers, they didn't ask kids how often they vaped or when the last time it was that they vaped. They only asked if at some time in their lives they've used an electronic cigarette. So even if a kid used an e-cig one time, no matter how long ago, in that study they would have been considered an e-cig user. If you watch the interview, this is one of the many things that Brent was hinting at when he was asking Glantz about how there seems to be issues with how the data is being interpreted from all of these different studies. If you read Glantz's blog, you'll see that it's full of biased interpretations of data and false statements about things that the researchers themselves don't even say. But there were some gold nuggets that came out of this interview. For example, Brent got Glantz to admit that electronic cigarettes are far safer than smoking cigarettes. And there was a point where Glantz mentioned that there are issues with inhaling particles from e-cigs, but then later he said that he doesn't believe e-cigs to be very toxic, and that his biggest concern is that kids will use electronic cigarettes and move to tobacco. I think that he realizes that the particles issue is pretty much nothing to be concerned about, and which is why he really didn't harp on it for the rest of the interview. Glantz also mentioned some other interesting things. He talked about that figure from the Public Health England study on electronic cigarettes and the Royal College of Physicians report on e-cigs that stated that vaping is 95% safer than smoking. Glantz says that he believes that number was pulled out of thin air without any evidence behind it. I don't find that very likely. Another thing that he mentioned was that Royal College of Physicians and Public Health England were only looking at cancer, not health as a whole. And he said that's where that 95% number comes from, only cancer. Uh, he said that most smokers don't die from cancer, but instead of cardiovascular disease and other non-cancerous lung diseases. Uh, that appears to be true to some degree. I actually looked up some data from the CDC and found some statistics on that. So these are the stats for smoking-related deaths from 2005 to 2009, so four years. Uh, cancer, all types of cancer, there were 163,700 deaths. Cardiovascular and metabolic diseases were 160,000 deaths, and respiratory disease contributed to 113,100 deaths. So Glantz, he combined cardiovascular and res respiratory diseases. In which case it's true that more smokers die from those conditions rather than cancer. But of all the ways that someone can die from smoking, cancer is the leading cause. So Glantz wasn't entirely truthful in that statement. 
Still, though, his claims that England's top medical researchers are only using the 95% number as it relates to cancer is an interesting one. And based on the wording of both the PHE study and the Royal College of Physicians report, I don't think that's true. For example, the Royal College of Physicians report states that hazard to health from long-term vaping is unlikely to exceed 5% of the harm of smoking tobacco. That term, hazard of health, sounds like an all-encompassing term to me, not just focusing on cancer. RCP, uh, Royal College of Physicians, they also state that this report, in their words here, quote, shows that for all potential risks involved, harm reduction has huge potential to prevent death and disability from tobacco use, end quote. And if you really dig into that report, you can see that they looked at respiratory issues, metabolic issues, and cardiovascular disease. And the same goes for the Public Health England study. Neither organization were looking at only cancer. So basically, Glantz is either lying or he just doesn't know the facts. If you know anything about Glantz history, he's most likely lying. All right, let's talk about something else that's been, uh, a lot of people have been talking about on uh, in regards to YouTube, vape reviewers on YouTube. Avenue 40, they are a vape distributor, uh, vape gear distributor. They recently came out with a YouTube series called The Vapor Games. And vaping with Twisted 420 first started talking about this. Uh, he posted a video sponsored by Avenue 40. He said that he reached out to them to see if they were interested in paying him to publish the video on his channel. They liked the idea and did it. Then reached out to other big reviewers to do the same thing. And quite a few reviewers actually did uh, post that sponsored video on their channels. A lot of people don't seem to be very happy with Twisted or any of the other reviewers who did this. People are calling these reviewers sellouts, untrustworthy, and saying things like this has destroyed the integrity of their, their channels. And people are saying that if these reviewers are accepting cash to promote a video, they're probably taking cash to do positive reviews too. In my opinion, I don't believe that at all. Reviewers like Twisted, Heathen Vapes, Mike Vapes, all of them, they're all fairly honest in their reviews. And they always mention cons with the devices they review. Now, I would worry if a reviewer was saying only positive things about devices that other people have found problems with but I just don't see that happening with any of these guys. Personally, I don't really see anything wrong with taking money to do a sponsor video. Uh, I haven't done it myself, but I don't think there's anything wrong with it. It's really not any different than doing paid advertising. Um, at, like if you had monetized videos, these reviewers, they weren't paid to do a positive review of anyone's products or even of Avenue 40. All they did was promote Avenue 40's video on their channel. I really don't understand the community's hatred for reviewers making money. It's a lot of work to produce these videos, and I think it's great when people can make money from doing something that they love. If they were taking money to do positive reviews, though, that would be a different story. It, but that's that just doesn't happen, at least not with the big reviewers. It might happen with some of the smaller guys, but you know those are the people who don't last, because you can see right through that. Anyway, have you seen those Avenue 40 videos? They are absolutely terrible. They're boring, they're cheesy, and they, they have really terrible audio, which is really surprising because it looks like they put a lot of money into it as far as the camera quality and uh, how they're staging everything. I would think that they would have enough money to uh, purchase some nice microphones. But yeah, their, their audio is so bad I can't even watch it. Even despite all this, that doesn't mean that these videos didn't do what Avenue 40 intended though. Uh, everyone's talking about them. They have lots of views and they've probably brought a lot of traffic to their website. These videos got their brand in front of people who have never heard of them, and the videos might have also strengthened Avenue 40's relationship with their partners who were interviewed at the end of those videos. Marketing-wise, I think Avenue 40 ran a pretty smart campaign. The videos are pretty bad, though. If you haven't seen them, they're the, these vapor games, they're basically videos where they do wacky games. Uh, there, it's a competition between two teams. The first one I saw was Avenue 40 versus Smoant, I think it was. Smoke or Smoant, I can't remember. But they did things like who could vape and fill up a balloon and pop it first. And uh, other really uh, gimmicky games. Go check that out if you're interested. It's uh, silly. Okay, and then I wrote a couple of new articles for the halosigs.com blog. Uh, one, one is on the importance of SIGA likes and the other one on how to advocate for vaping. I'll talk a little bit about both of those, but if you want the full articles, go check out my page on their site. You can find that at halosigs.com slash blog slash author slash Alex Jewell, J-U-E-L. Um, 
So first let's talk about the importance of SIGA likes. My original article had seven reasons, but Halo's editors cut it down to five due to legal reasons most likely. Uh, their legal team is overly cautious with the things that they say on their website. So they usually cut anything that talks about smoking, uh, any kind of smoking cigarettes. They just don't say it. Or if it implies using other brands' products, or if it talks about anything that they don't sell. So sometimes the articles can be pretty heavily edited. But I'm going to give you all of seven reasons in the way that I really wanted to say them. So number one, Sigil likes most closely mimic the smoking experience. This one was completely cut from the article. Um, my reasons for this are that most people who use Sigil likes are smokers or former smokers and want something that resembles a cigarette. Uh, they want it to feel like a cigarette and look like a cigarette. And they don't want to feel awkward or out of place with a large device. They don't want to bring attention to themselves. And this is actually the exact reason why I chose a Sigil like when I first started vaping. Um, I felt like if I was going to quit, I needed something that was exactly like a cigarette. And I even chose one that was, it was white, it had a white battery, the tip lit up red, just like a cigarette, and the cartridge looked like a filter. It was yellow. So my first Sigil like looked as close as possible to a cigarette, and that's what I wanted. All right, number two, Sigil likes are cheap. If you don't like them, it's not going to hurt your wallet. You can easily upgrade if it's not strong enough. And my tip to anyone thinking about going to Sigil likes uh, is that you shouldn't go with an expensive one. They're all pretty much the same as far as batteries. The cartridges are what, what are different. It's really the e-juice. Uh, the only thing you need to worry about is if the Sigil like you buy has the ability to use cartridges from other devices. For example, the Views, that can only use Views cartridges, which I think suck. But uh, I do know someone who actually loves Views e-cigs, even after trying other brands that I think are much better. So it's really all about figuring, figuring out what you like. But originally I used a green smoke battery and uh, also a South Beach smoke. And both cartridges, the cartridges for both brands were interchangeable on those batteries. So uh, that's something to keep in mind. All right, number three, Sigalikes are small. So I like to keep a Sigalike in my wallet because of how small they are. Um, I don't use it all the time, but I like to have it there for when I need it or when I want it. Um, and like if I know if I'm going to be in a crowded event and I want to vape discreetly, that small size of a Sigalike is perfect. Okay, number four, not everyone wants a lot of power. So most new vapers, they don't want high power and they don't even enjoy it. Uh, the little amount of power that a Sigalike offers is, in my opinion, a really good introduction to vaping. All right, number five, beginners want to see if they like vaping first before diving in. So I think it's better for vapors to start small and then move up. You might find your sweet spot at the very bottom and never need anything else. And you see this happen all the time. There's hundreds of thousands of people who are using Sigalikes and are perfectly happy with it. And then the same goes for vape pens. Um, one step up from a Sigalike. There's thousands of people who love vape pens and they're, they get, they're totally satisfied with it, so there's no reason to move up or buy anything more expensive. And really, vape gear these days is so cheap that it doesn't really cost a lot to upgrade gradually. So, I mean, you can get a Sigalike from 7-Eleven or Walgreens for $7, the Enjoy Daily. That's that's my favorite Sigalike now. And, you know, that's, what is, that's a cost of a pack of cigarettes, I think. I don't know, I haven't bought cigarettes in a long time, but... Yeah, for the cost of cigarettes, a pack of cigarettes, you can get a cheap Sigalike, which works good. If you don't like it, you can upgrade to a vape pen. Uh, you can also get that at a vape shop or at Walgreens or 7-Eleven for like $20 and a bottle of e-juice. And then, you know, that $20, that ain't bad either. And if you don't like that, then you can go to a vape shop and get something a lot more higher powered. And even some of the really high powered stuff, unless you start getting to, into the hobbyist side of vaping, some of the high powered gear that you can get these days, you know, like a 200 watt mod, you can find for like 30 or 40 bucks if you look for good sales online. So it's really not that expensive to get into vaping anymore. Okay, number six, ease of use. So with most Sigil likes these days, you just open the package and vape. Uh, it's not confusing or daunting for a first timer to use. And I think that's what a lot of people are looking for, just ease of use. And number seven, this is another one that was cut entirely from uh, Halo's article. Sigalikes have more nicotine. And this is actually another one of the reasons why I really love the Enjoy Daily. 
and because it has something like 15 milligrams nicotine um, and this comes in really handy if I don't have a lot of time to vape because I can just take a few puffs, get the amount of nicotine that I like, and uh, get back to doing whatever I need to do. So yeah, there you go. There's seven reasons why I think Sigalikes are a good thing. I'm personally not a fan of the Sigalikes that big tobacco brands make, like the Mark 10, the Blue, or the Views, simply out of principle because they're made by big tobacco. But if that's what gets people to quit smoking, then hell yeah, I'm all for it. I'm glad it works for them. Uh, my favorite sig like is the Enjoy Daily, like I've mentioned, and I haven't really used any others on the market, or at least not since I quit smoking six years ago. But uh, like I also mentioned, when I first quit smoking, I used the Green Smoke and the South Beach sig likes and that's all I used. Uh, I didn't upgrade. sig likes worked for me, and... Uh, and I didn't vape for, I quit three months after buying those sig likes I didn't smoke or vape in five years until I got into the hobbyist side of vaping in 2015. But if it wasn't for sig likes I wouldn't be a part of this vaping community. So I am very grateful for, for having the opportunity to have used those sig likes And then the second article that I wrote about for halosigs.com was on how to advocate for vaping. So... If you're listening to this podcast, you most likely know about all the regulations happening in the industry right now, or the proposed regulations happening at state and city levels in some places, like Pennsylvania, for example. Obviously, it's extremely important that we have people advocating for our right to vape. So let's talk about some things you can do to help. Number one, educate yourself. If you want to win an argument with someone against vaping, you need to be knowledgeable. You need to know the studies that, dis that disprove common arguments. You need to keep up to date with regulations and laws, and you need to follow reputable news sources. For example, Dr. Michael Siegel or Dr. Farsalinos Constantinos, they both write about news on medical research. Uh, you can also get your news from places like GrimGreen.com and SpinFuel.com for just general news and in industry. Uh, Vaping360.com, that's a great source for uh, laws and advocacy. Look for Jim McDonald. He's an amazing resource. And then uh, you can follow advocacy groups. You can subscribe to their newsletters and get regular updates. Or you can go nuts like me uh, and follow every blog you can find, set up lists in Twitter, set up Google alerts for certain keywords, and just scan forums daily. So lots of ways to educate yourself. And number two, you can support advocacy groups. So let's talk a little bit about the advocacy groups that are around right now. Um, there are a lot of them, but these are the big guys. So, CASA, this is the Consumer Advocates for Smoke-Free Alternatives Association. This is, in my opinion, the best advocacy association for general consumers. They send out alerts that consumers can take action on. The biggest downfall of CASA, though, is that they only have two employees, which really limits how much information they can put out. But as a consumer, you should support this group. All right, and if you're a business owner, there are several organizations that you can support or become a member of. So the first one let's talk about here is the Vapor Technology Association. So they are a national trade association for all vape businesses. They take a very conservative approach to advocacy, which some people don't agree with, but they do appear to be a trustworthy organization. Um, then we have the American Vaping Association. Their aim is for educating about the health benefits of vaping. They consist mostly of businesses, but they also have some consumers too. Um, then we have Safada, the Smoke Free Alternatives Trade Association. This is a very big organization for businesses. There has been a, a bit of drama around them lately, especially after uh, Cynthia Cabrera was removed from the organization. I hear a lot of disagreements with Safada's internal policies and beliefs. I don't really have any inter inside knowledge about that, so that's about all I can say. But I remember an understudy from the Plumes of Hazard show saying that they wouldn't be renewing their membership with Safada based on his experience with them. But they do have a new president, so I don't know, maybe they've cleaned some things up. And I realize that a lot of what I just said sounds concerning, but I really urge you to do your own research before taking my word for it because Safada has been around for a while and they are a very big organization that people trust. So uh, look into them if you are if you do own a vape business. All right, the next one here. American E-Liquid Manufacturers Standards Association. So these guys, they're focused entirely on e-liquid manufacturing. So if, if you are an e-liquid company, you should probably be a member of them. Okay, and then we have the Right to Be Smoke Free Coalition. So this organization is a large collection of the biggest, biggest businesses in the vape industry. 
They advocate for reasonable laws and regulations. They're the ones taking the FDA to court right now to fight against the August 8th regulations that deem vaping products as tobacco. So they're absolutely worth supporting, in my opinion. And lastly, your local advocacy groups. So there are many state-based smoke-free associations around the U.S., most of them with Facebook groups so that you can easily get updates. For example, I follow uh, Safada, the local Denver chapter, and there's always a lot of really great updates in there, letting people know about any uh, rallies happening or, uh, you know, just things like that. Safada as a whole, or even Kasa as a whole, they don't always have time to to alert everybody of really small rallies happening in your in small cities. So uh, it's good to be a member or to subscribe to those local advocacy groups, advocacy groups on Facebook. Okay, number three, become a volunteer. Advocacy groups can always use volunteers. Look at Casa, for example. They only have one full-time employee, Alex Clark. He can't do everything on his own. So ask your local groups if you can help distribute event materials or create signs for rallies. Uh, if you offer your time, I'm sure your local groups can find something for you to do. All right, number four, use social media. Some advocates feel like social media efforts are lazy, but I think social media is very important. Research shows that in 2016, 78% of U.S. Americans have a social media profile, and that's growing every day. This is where people get their news these days. If the only thing you can do is share something advocacy-related on social media, don't feel bad about that just because it's easy. It can be an effective method that spreads the word. So definitely do it. All right, number five, you can organize a fundraiser. Advocacy groups survive on donations. If you can set up a local fundraiser, like a GoFundMe, or even if you have a fundraising garage sale, you can earn some monies and donate it uh, back to, the organ to your local organization. One thing to note though, if you do a garage sale, you wanna make sure that you get permission from the organization you're donating to to use their name on any kind of printed materials that you have hanging up. And another thing too, uh, if you really wanna get a lot of stuff to sell, get people to donate stuff to your yard sale. That way you're not just getting rid of all of your own stuff. All right, number six, host an event for education. This is one of my favorite ones. If you have the space, get some food together and invite your community over to watch a documentary. Uh, the BBC Horizon documentary called E-Cigarettes, Miracle or Menace. That's a good one. Um, another good one that people are talking about a lot recently is called Beyond the Cloud. But that one's only in French and has English subtitles. So not everyone might be interested in that one. And When a Billion Lives comes out, that's sure to be another really good one. If you don't want to do a documentary, you can have a speaker. Uh, you can do it yourself if you're a good speaker. Or maybe you can see if someone from one of your local advocacy groups would be interested in speaking. And at the very least, just get some food together, hand out some educational materials, and answer questions if anyone has them. So this is a, a really great way to educate your community about something that they probably have no idea about. And there you go, that's six tips for becoming a vape advocate. And as Grim Green would say, you don't have to do everything, but you have to do something. And uh, I, I, he actually got that from someone else, and I can't remember who, so I apologize to whoever that quote originally goes to, but it's a great quote, and I really believe in it. Anything you can do helps, no matter how small. Um, if you think that I've left anything out, or if you have more information to add, please let me know, because I'll be writing another blog post about this on my own website, and uh, I plan to update it as much as I can, whenever I can, so... I want it to be as thorough as possible. So yeah, please, if you have anything to add, send me an email or uh, leave a comment on my YouTube page. Okay, so that's all I have for this week. Uh, you'll find show notes for this episode on vapepassion.com. Just do a search for episode 35. If you want to support the show, consider donating to my Patreon page at patreon.com slash vapepassion. You can follow me on Twitter at Vape Passion. I'm also on Facebook and uh, many other social networks. Just go to my website to find those. If you like this weekly show, please consider giving me a thumbs up on the video and so subscribe to my channel if you're not already a subscriber. Um, you can also subscribe to the podcast version of this show on either iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play. If you'd like to get notifications of new reviews or of this show, you can sign up to receive my weekly email on vapepassion.com. And if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to email me at alex at vapepassion.com. All right, I'll see you next week.